of the Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming. Uh, while the debate in Congress over high gas prices has been red hot this summer, families in the Northeast and Midwest have also been thinking about how they will cope with the cold weather this winter. The prices of home heating fuels have been skyrocketing, and millions of families will face tough choices during the upcoming months between the purchasing of fuel or purchasing of food. The Department of Energy's projections for home heating prices this winter are grim. DOE forecasts that families in the Northeast who use heating oil will spend 30 percent more this winter than last year, an increase of more than $600. Families using natural gas will spend nearly 20 percent more this year. And regardless of the region of the country on the, uh, on, uh, or the uh, home heating fuel, the Department of Energy is forecasting that families will experience a substantial increase in their heating costs this winter. We will be hearing from the Department of Energy uh, later on this afternoon. American consumers who have already uh, been getting tipped upside down when they pull up to the gas pump will now also face high energy prices when they return home. And incredibly, this year, many low-income families will spend even more to heat their homes than they have already spent on record gasoline prices. Low-income families, uh, on average, spend roughly 15 percent of their income on home energy bills. For nearly 30 years, the LIHEAP program, the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, has helped low-income families pay their home energy bills. This program has been a vital safety net for millions of Americans. However, uh, under the Bush administration, this program has been woefully underfunded. In his budget request this year, President Bush proposed cutting total LIHEAP funding by 22 percent reducing it from $2.57 billion to $2 billion. Indeed, in recent years, LIHEAP has generally been funded at less than half of its authorized level of $5.1 billion. As a result, last year, LIHEAP was only able to provide assistance to about 15 percent of eligible families nationwide. At a time of record oil prices, the President can't continue to freeze funding for this important heating assistance program. Earlier this week, nearly 100 members uh, signed a letter requesting that LIHEAP receive full funding in any continuing resolution uh, that passes the Congress. And yesterday, under the leadership of Speaker Pelosi, uh, the House passed a continuing resolution that would massively increase LIHEAP funding, providing a total of $5.1 billion for the program. That is full funding at the authorized level. This additional funding could not come at a more important time to ensure that families will not be left out in the cold this winter. Indeed, the increase in LIHEAP funding over last year's level that is included in the CR would be greater than the total funding level for the program in 25 out of the 27 years that the program has existed. The House passed continuing resolution would also expand the number of people eligible for LIHEAP assistance in order to help additional families already struggling under the increased cost of everything from gas to groceries. So Governor Patrick, um, who is our, our first witness, has given outstanding uh, leadership uh, to this uh, program. Uh, many members of this uh, committee uh, are also on the Financial Services Committee and uh, other committees with jurisdiction over this financial uh, bailout that we are going to be deliberating upon um, uh, later on today and tomorrow. Uh, and so that's just uh, an unfortunate set of uh, circumstances that has developed that, uh, uh, that as the afternoon goes by, I think uh, uh, we'll be visited by those members as well. But I don't think it should interfere with hearing from Governor Patrick at this time so that he can be recognized uh, to make his uh, statement to the committee. We welcome you, sir. We thank you for your great leadership uh, on this issue. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and thanks to you and the members of the committee for the opportunity to appear today and testify. I know, as you mentioned, that the turmoil in the financial markets is dominating your own and the general public's attention today, as well as should. It's certainly on my mind, and I'm sure on the mind of every other governor in the country. Especially under those circumstances, I thank you for turning some of your attention today to the subject of this hearing, a crisis in the making 
that has the potential to become a public health threat in Massachusetts, in New England, and in many other parts of the country. I'm talking about the crisis in home heating costs that, could, that cold weather states expect this winter. Without help, many of our most vulnerable citizens will find themselves facing heating bills they cannot pay. And the challenge is right around the corner. Nighttime temperatures are already dropping into the 40s and 30s this week in New England. Unless we prepare, including by fully funding the LIHEAP fuel assistance program, my state and others will face what some call a slow motion, Katrina. Let me try to dimensionalize the challenge for you. Home heating oil is used by nearly 40% or 963,000 Massachusetts households. According to, the, to our Department of Energy Resources regular statewide survey of prices, the average price of home heating oil in Massachusetts hit a record high of $4.71 a gallon after steadily rising week after week for over a year. Now, even after the recent moderating of those prices, uh, prices of uh, heating fuels have settled in at roughly $4 a gallon, which is 50 percent higher than just last year when the average price was $2.70 a gallon. Should the price remain at $4 a gal gallon through the coming heating system, uh, season, it will take more than $3,200 to heat an average Massachusetts household with oil this winter, up from $1,800 just two winters ago. Many consider that estimated average to be conservative. If a family uses the more commonplace 1,100 gallons next winter, which is not unusual, as I say, it will cost them over $4,000 to heat their home. Again, that compares to $1,800 just two winters ago. The Massachusetts LIHEAP program is expected to serve almost 144,000 households this winter. With rising energy costs and level funding, our benefits would barely cover half the roughly $1,130 it costs to fill a tank of heating oil. At that rate, the benefit would run out by the end of this calendar year. So I want to thank the House for substantially increasing the federal funding for the LIHEAP program through the continuing resolution passed last night and for doing so on a broad bipartisan basis. The prospect of significantly higher home heating costs this coming winter was sufficiently alarming to me and to my colleagues in the legislature that we formed a winter energy costs task force. In five public hearings across the state, the task force heard compelling testimony about the impact that high heating costs would have on our most vulnerable citizens, including low-income families with children, people with disabilities, and seniors as well. I just want to give you a couple of the stories that we learned about. One about a senior citizen from Gloucester, not unusual, who is living on $790 a month to pay for his housing and medical expenses, and who beyond that could not afford uh, the oil needed to heat his home. Without an increase in funding for fuel assistance, he would be eligible for only so much as to buy two-thirds of one tank, which might not even get him to January. He's considering a reverse mortgage in order to get by this winter. In another example, a director of a community action program in Lynn told the story of a woman with three school-age kids who just lost her job. She's collecting $157 each week in unemployment. She doesn't even have enough to cover her rent of $800 a month. Without additional LIHEAP funding, fuel assistance won't be enough to fill her oil, ta her oil tank even once. This CAP director, uh, who told us that story, said that in 29 years of his own service, he's never seen so many folks asking for fuel assistance for the first time. Now, I do want you to know that Massachusetts is doing everything we can to avoid disaster this winter. Our Department of Public Utilities has recently ordered an increase uh, in the discount given to low-income customers on their electric and natural gas bills, which will save them between $75 and $300 over the coming winter. We've also expanded programs to help low-income customers pay past due bills. We have appropriated $10 million in state funds in unusually tight fiscal times to supplement federal fuel assistance funding this winter as well. And we're working to expand energy efficiency services provided by utilities this fall to help their customers tighten and insulate their homes as well as upgrade their heating, heating systems with the help of rebates and low interest loans. These latter measures, by the way, are consistent with the accelerated implementation of what we call the Green Communities Act, a comprehensive energy reform legislation, which I know you know about, Mr. Chairman, that I signed into law earlier this year. 
In addition, we're going to use the proceeds of the very first auction of greenhouse, greenhouse gas emission allowances under the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which took place this morning, to support uh, energy efficiency efforts. The specific targets of those investments will depend on the recommendations of that Winter Energy Costs Task Force I mentioned uh, a moment ago. We'll have their report shortly on measures that we can take to help our fellow citizens stay warm and safe this winter. But the fact is that we still need you. I very much understand and respect the demands of, for resources that compete for your attention. I really do. Nevertheless, what is at stake is the real possibility that many citizens in the colder regions of this country will be at risk of freezing to death without federal help. So I thank you again for the House action yesterday, and I urgently ask the full Congress to fully fund the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program at the $5.1 billion level now under consideration as part of the continuing resolution. This funding would, also, would almost double this winter's expected lie heat benefit in Massachusetts, providing enormous help to families across the Commonwealth and indeed to families uh, in all of the affected regions. I lastly just want to acknowledge that though essential, this funding is a stopgap measure. High energy costs in the Northeast are a foreseeable and continuing reality. A dedicated federal plan that includes support for state lie heat programs and also for efficiency strategies and renewable energy generation and delivery is, a, is the big task remaining. And we look forward to working with you on that as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Governor, very much. Uh, let me now turn and recognize the uh, gentleman from uh, Arizona, Mr. Shattuck. Governor, I want to thank you for your appearance here. This is an important topic. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, and I share many of the concerns you expressed. Um, as I listen to you, I'm not going to ask questions, but as I listen to you, I couldn't help but think of T. Boone Pickens and his argument to us that uh, natural gas is more plentiful in this country uh, and that it is a cleaner fuel. Uh, I guess that uh, leads me to wondering, uh, and I listen to you describe the program you have to encourage people to put in more efficient uh, fuel uh, heating systems in their homes, uh, obviously gaining uh, as much savings as we can in energy in this country through efficiency gains, through better insulation, and through the utilization of cleaner fuels, for example, natural gas, are all a part of this problem. Uh, LIHEAP has played a key role. Uh, I am going to uh, suggest or request that a letter from one of your colleagues, my governor, uh, Janet Napolitano, uh, be inserted in the record. It's a letter she wrote in September to Governor uh, to Michael Levitt, former Governor Michael Levitt, about the inequity. Uh, I, I'm not, uh, um, I, I don't, I do not know that heat kills as many Americans as cold or is as vast a problem, but it is a real problem. Uh, we do have people in Arizona uh, who die as a result of not having heat in their homes, and, and that is as big a tragedy as somebody dying in your home state of the lack of heat. Uh, Arizona is in, in some ways blessed by having uh, both problems. We have parts of Arizona which are, uh, quite frankly, as cold as Massachusetts. And so uh, this program is important. I guess I would hope for the day when we need this program less because we've taken on uh, uh, American energy and brought down the price of energy by forging out into the future as my colleague from Massachusetts has pushed us to do for so long. Uh, so I would request unanimous consent to put that letter into the record. I commend you for your Without work. Without objection. So what? I commend you for your work and initiative in this area and I appreciate your testimony. With that, uh, I'll yield back. Great. Um, any comment? Governor? Well, I just say, Congressman, first of all, on the, on the point about natural gas, I couldn't agree with you with you more in terms of its uh, impact on the environment. It is a lot cleaner than uh, than the burning of uh, uh, of oil or uh, or coal for that for that matter. It's a challenge for us because we're at the end of the pipeline, and so we have been working on strategies, some with Canada and some with other suppliers, on how safely to deliver liquefied natu natu natural gas into the pipeline that affects us in in New England. We don't have a solution for that, but we have been working on it. And I take your point also about um, about the uh, uh, concerns that are different, um, but no less. Um, uh, no less significant in their impact on human beings of extreme heat, um, just as extreme uh, cold, and not being able to uh, uh, necessarily deal with that or respond uh, to it. I understand that the light heat program will be up for reauthorization soon, and I suspect that uh, um, tough as those issues are, they'll get worked out there, and we look forward to being part of that conversation. 
Well, as hot as it is in Arizona and parts of the year, it presents a very real challenge. Uh, and uh, fortunately, I think we're going to look at this program and, and find a little bit greater equity in it. But I appreciate your efforts. Thank, Thank you. you. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Governor, do you work with other uh, governors in the region in putting together a strategy to deal with this issue? Well, we've worked with uh, governors in the region on two fronts. First of all, the, uh, the, we had all of the governors uh, in New England together um, to uh, discuss uh, common ways or just really to trade best practices around efficiencies um, and to help prepare for the coming winter. We did that in July, and it was um, following that that we wrote to the president and to the congressional leadership asking for um, the full funding of LIHEAP and the weather weatherization program, precisely the action that you took in the, uh, uh, in the continuing resolution. So again, thank you uh, for that. The outcome of the uh, winter uh, uh, energy cost task force that I mentioned earlier, the recommendations that will come from that from Massachusetts, we will share with our, uh, with our colleagues uh, around the region, and we've been taking some of their counsel uh, as well. And finally, I'd mentioned that just um, two weeks ago, maybe last week, I'm losing track of time, the New England governors met with the Eastern Canadian uh, premiers, which we do periodically, but particularly to talk about how we can begin to, uh, uh, to um, economically get renewable energy generated in Canada down into our, uh, into our region. Now, that would, that would really be a huge breakthrough if we could accomplish that goal. Um, and you put together a joint task force this past summer in anticipation of um, the higher energy prices this That's winter. Right. Could you talk a little bit about that and the lessons that other states might learn from? Well, we'll, we'll have those recommendations uh, within the next week or so, um, Mr. Chairman. They are, they are due at the end of this month to myself, the Speaker, and the, and the Senate President. They took testimony uh, from around the, the Commonwealth so that we were getting practical um, and not theoretical insights. Um, LIHEAP was a part of that uh, discussion, but not the sole part by any means. A lot of interest in how we support efficiency uh, initiatives, um, including uh, weatherization, including changing out uh, or updating uh, uh, inefficient heating systems, um, that sort of thing, and what resources there are uh, for that. Some of this is paid for already by um, a um, uh, uh, an added charge on utility bills. And we have, um, and I've used my own, you know, sort of bully pulpit to encourage residents to get those energy audits now um, before the weather gets too, too cold so that they can begin to prepare. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Chair recognizes the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I'm sorry I'm late, but I was getting my picture took with the Judiciary Committee and uh, since I have my bright red tie on, that ended up being more important. Sorry, Governor. <laughs> no uh, worries. Um, uh, secondly, I have an opening statement I'd ask unanimous consent to be included in the record. Without objection, it will be. Um, and, you know, thirdly, you know, let me say that while I think the LIHE program uh, is important, you know, I express my concern about how the formula operates. Uh, you know, the Chairman and I both represent cold weather states. Uh, uh, having uh, assistance to low-income people is much more uh, important in cold weather states than it is in places that your constituents, Governor, and mine flee to, like Arizona, which get, get hot upon occasion but doesn't get, get, get cold very much. And, you know, uh, uh, the LIHEAP program, in my opinion, was designed to help people stay warm when it was cold, not to help people cool down when it was warm. And, uh, I guess I can say that I'm not surprised, but I'm a little disappointed in seeing the letter that's up here from the governor of Arizona saying that she isn't getting her fair share um, when nobody's going to freeze in Arizona or in most places in Arizona. So uh, having put that marker in and raising the blood pressure of the gentleman to my left, I'll you back <laughs> balance my time. Will the gentleman yield? <laughs> of course I will. So. You missed my remarks. Uh, heat kills people. Uh, it actually, all kidding aside, uh, heat does kill people. Uh, and I'm not saying that it is as expansive a problem uh, as it is for cold states, nor fortunately does it last as long. But it does kill people. 
And I also pointed out in your absence yeah. that there are parts of Arizona where cold kills people, where, uh, our, for example, our Native Americans wow. on the Navajo Reservation uh, um, have the same kind of confront, time, confront know, the same cold problems that you do. Time, uh, let, let, me, let me say to my colleague from Arizona that I thought I had him on our side on the whole debate on global warming, and I'm afraid you're falling off the wagon, <laughs> and now I'll yield back. We haven't seen that, by the way, in two years. This is a, this is a, this is a high point on our final hearing. The uh, uh, chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Solis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I welcome our, our guests for being here. Thank you. I'd like to also submit my statement for the record, if I could do that, Mr. Chairman. Anyway, um, I just want to welcome you, Governor, here. Um, I'm excited about some of the things you're doing in your state and want to know Without how... Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. And I'd like to know how um, the federal government might be able to help expand some of your state efforts for weatherization and the LIHEAP program. Um, we're very concerned in the state of California, in my district, uh, creating opportunities, job opportunities also in weatherization um, and also other technologies uh, in the form of green collar technologies. So right. Any thoughts on that? A couple. Um, we've been working in this area of efficiency and alternatives for some while now. We have some um, new legislation, a package of legislation that includes something called the Green Communities Act and o Act and Oceans Bill, Green Jobs uh, Initiative, Biofuels Initiative, which are all a part uh, of a comprehensive uh, approach where we are trying both to get ahead of the issue on, um, on uh, um, efficiencies and renewables and also create uh, new manufacturing jobs in particular. And we're making some, we're making some progress. I do think that the, the, re the weatherization program, uh, whose funding was also substantially increased in the, uh, uh, in the continuing resolution, I uh, alluded to it briefly before you came in, but this is enormously important. And this is one of those um, examples of, of teaching someone um, to fish rather than um, just giving them uh, a fish. Um, that it's so that um, we can leverage um, those investments at the federal um, level with state money as we're trying to do uh, and some of the subsidies that are already built into um, utility bills to enable um, and to show people what strategies are available to them, practically help them mm -hmm. uh, move to more efficient insulation, um, updating uh, heating and cooling systems, that sort of, uh, that sort of thing. We had an initiative here in the uh, Congress. The president actually signed a bill, the energy bill that included about 100, and proposed 125 million to create green collar jobs. Our thoughts were to try to see how we could get that uh, back through the Department of Labor and Energy and through the Workforce Investment Act right. that could go to states like yours. How would that be helpful? And Absolutely. How do you see that? Absolutely. We have we have two areas, really three, but two um, uh, I will mention where. Um, uh, our economy ha is showing particularly sharp growth. One is um, is the life sciences, and the other is uh, is so-called green tech. And um, the biggest concern among many, but the biggest concern about the long-term future is the availab availability of a well-trained workforce. So we have tried to um, to target more of our limited state dollars in that direction. We welcome any federal assistance we could get. Great. Okay. Thank you. Yield back. The lady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from uh, South Dakota, Ms. Herseth Sandler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have any questions for Governor Patrick. I thank you for being here and thank for you. your testimony and for the leadership you're undertaking and the state initiatives that are so important in serving our constituents, but also recognizing the importance of the federal resources to help leverage those front funds and serve more people. So thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Thank you, uh, Governor. Thanks for your leadership on this issue. I wanted to ask you about the relationship between efficiency measures, weatherization, and cash reimbursement. I suspect that almost probably in 90 percent at least of houses, uh, you know, a $1,000 expenditure to weatherize the home is going to save the resident over 10 years more than a $1,000 reimbursement right. for their heating costs. And almost every home, including mine, there's still a lot of efficiency improvements to make that are cost effective. With that in mind, if you agree with that, how do we, what's the best distribution between, you know, upfront capital to help reduce those 
inefficiencies and you know cash reimbursement. Ideally, how would we allocate that fund? Well, you, if I can, if I can respond to your. Uh, question, uh, Congressman, and also um, come back to um, the ranking member's um, comments without wading into the uh, debate between you and your colleague there. Um, there is a, um, we, we appreciate very much the um, substantial increase in both LIHEAP and weatherization funding in the continuing resolution, but it's a stopgap. And there is a broader strategy which we would look forward to working uh, with all of you on around um, how we move to, uh, toward a more um, comprehensive efficiency um, alternative um, framework for the country. Um, until we do some of that homework, I couldn't tell you what the trade-offs exactly would be, but I can tell you that right now um, in Massachusetts where we have um, a generally older housing stock, um, efficiency tends to pay back uh, at the rate of about 20 percent a year. That's a pretty, so you don't even have to look out 10 years. You can look out just four on that, uh, or five on that thousand uh, mm -hmm. dollars and have it, um, have it paid for. Um, so the, the, um, the uh, now, we also have um, some compounding challenges, which kind of comes back to the ranking member's point. Differences in cold weather states than, um, than in warm weather states, I think, and also um, differences in the cost of, uh, of heating oil in particular um, and other heating sources in the Northeast because we're at the end of the pipeline. So the payback, the rate of payback is going to be different because the price of the, uh, of the commodity is, uh, is different. But you can imagine that the, that the uh, and you have, that the, um, the return in the long run and moving toward efficiency um, is greater than having to come back every year and, uh, uh, and spend, we, it's not that we may get away from that entirely, at least in the short run, but having to come back every year and reappropriate for, uh, for more straight cash uh, assistance. I hope one day we'll be able to wean ourselves of that. Well, uh, some of us think it's better to try to do the weatherization and insulation um, and maybe reduce the rate of global warming rather than just wait for your climate to change so that you become a problem of heating rather than cooling. That's we not what I'm advocating. Okay, I just <laughs> want to make sure that's the situation. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Um, actually, Governor, in, in uh, last year's budget, there was uh, $228 million for weatherization in the continuing resolution yesterday. Uh, it was increased to 478 million. And we so, very much appreciate uh, more that. More than a doubling, and, and uh, hopefully, you know, more innovative programs will flow out of Massachusetts and Wisconsin and other states that uh, can, uh, to get, that can help to, you know, chart a new course. And Arizona. Uh, Chairman, we need uh, to insulate. And, and, uh, we need to California. insulate in Arizona as and, well. I, I, Insulation I, I, is I a good thing, even sentence. hot there place. Was a run-on sentence with no uh, period <laughs> that had yet arrived. Um, um, you know, some of my happiest memories are at, at Fort Huachuca, Arizona, in the summer of 1969. Uh, didn't go under 110 any day, and I'm willing to stipulate that. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to stipulate the, uh, the, uh, the conditions that existed there. Um, so we uh, we thank you, Governor, very thank much you. for uh, being here. Any closing, you know, statement you'd like to make? Well, uh, just again, hear. you know, as I, I think. Uh, I think probably you uh, you don't hear from us when, uh, with thanks as often as you'd uh, as you're entitled to, uh, or you shouldn't. We thank you very much for the uh, for the support through the continuing resolution, and we urge um, the Senate uh, to act uh, similarly and the president to sign the bill. On that subject, we are in total and permanent concurrence, uh, hoping the Senate will do the right thing. That's right. Uh, you know that's something that is the o overarching uh, reality of our lives. Uh, Wonderful to see you again, Governor. Nice to see you. Thank, Thank you. you. For your great testimony. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Um, our um, our second panel. We would invite then up to um, to the uh, witness panel as soon as the uh, um, governor has uh, been able to assemble his. On our uh, second panel, um, uh, we have. Uh, Mark Wolf, who is the executive director of the National Energy.
Again, we, we, our first witness is uh, Mark Wolf. He's the Executive Director of the National Energy Assistance uh, Directors Association, representing the state directors of the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you. Um, first, on behalf of the members of NIEDA, I'd like to first take the opportunity to thank the members of the Select Committee for holding today's hearing on the importance of higher funding for LAHEAP to help low-income families pay their home energy bills this winter. LAHEAP is the only federal program that helps families pay their home energy bills. There is no comparable program for gasoline, for example. It's a discretionary grant program, and FY 2008 only had sufficient funding to meet the energy needs of about 16 percent of the nation's poorest households. Rising energy prices are placing millions of low-income families at risk of losing access to home energy. We are witnessing record arrearages across the country as families struggle to pay high energy bills at utilities, as well as families struggling to pay delivered fuel bills for heating oil and propane. These, this is followed by high rates of shutoffs as families lose their ability and access to, to um, utility service. The good news, actually the excellent news, of course, is the House already nearly doubled funding for LAHEAP to $5.1 billion and added $250 million for weatherization. Hopefully this will lead to a policy discussion in the next Congress as to the appropriate level of funding for LAHEAP and its place in the social service system. In the future, as we continue to cope with high and volatile pricing for all forms of home energy. And I think just to give a sense of what does $5.1 billion mean, in Arizona, it would take us from $9 million last year to $29 million. California, $103 million last year to $225 million. Massachusetts would go from $126 million to $163 million. Wisconsin, from $91 million to $130 million. South Dakota, $17 million to $30 million. And Washington State, $45 million to $75 million. What this really means at the end of the day, at $2.5 billion, which was the amount of money we had last year, it was really only enough money to provide a minimally adequate program in the cold weather states and at best an emergency program in the rest of the country. That's what $2.5 billion bought us. But $5.1 billion really transforms the program to creating a truly national basis for providing home energy assistance across the country for both heating and cooling. One of the issues that came up a lot in the last couple of months was why, why were we asking for $5.1 billion? First, winter home heating costs have been increasing rapidly since the end of the last economic recession in 2002. One of the tables we prepared, which is, um, uh, actually that's not the right one, well, uh, well, we'll use that one. Um, <laughs> uh, was the middle one, actually. Yeah. Uh, no, the first one. Go back. Keep going. There you go. Okay. Uh, since the last recession ended in 2002, home energy prices have gone up dramatically. Heating oil went from $912 to cost to heat a home during the winter of 2002-2003 to an estimated $2,500 during the coming winter heating season, or an increase of about 176 percent. In this coming winter season, prices are expected to go about 30 percent. Natural gas increased by 69 percent propane by 105 percent, electricity by 34 percent during this period since 2002. What's really worrisome to us about this is that energy went from a period of being basically affordable back in 2002 to 2003 to an awful lot of Americans. There were many low-income families that could afford to pay the average of $681. But with an average cost starting to approach $1,200 and finding more and more families that just can't pay these bills, more families are falling behind on their, on their um, on the utility, on the natural gas and electric bills, and more and more rearages and shutoffs. The other issue, of course, is purchasing power of LAHEAP. Without the $5.1 billion, we would have seen a dramatic decrease in the purchasing power this winter. In 2006, when LAHEAP funding peaked at $3.2 billion, we were able to cover close to half the cost on average of home heating. It wasn't terrific. It didn't meet all the needs, but allowed us to negotiate with utilities, allowed us to deal with arrearages, and allowed us to cover significant costs of the cost of delivered fuels. With the continuing rise in energy costs last year, we were only able to cover about 36 percent of the cost of home heating. It was definitely not enough. Um, and the kinds of things that happened last year 
that we hope won't happen this year is we'll see fewer people facially suffering. We saw people being shut off from power. We've had reports in some utility districts of up to 10% of the households being shut off. In some cases, it amounts to a small city within a state losing access to electricity and natural gas. Um, if you look at the next table, one of the things that concerns us, yes, heating oil costs are coming down, and that, that's terrific. In the middle of July, we were looking at upwards of $5 a gallon for home heating oil. Now we're in the range of about $4. So in a sense, that sounds terrific. But that's still a dollar more a gallon than it was at last year at this time. And what that really means, for, to fill up a 275-gallon tank, a typical gang, tank of heating oil in the Northeast, it's close to $1,000 now. For many people, especially the elderly, that's more their entire monthly income. The average single person who gets Social Security gets $1,027 a month. That's about the cost of one tank of oil. One, another indicator of the rising need for energy assistance is the increase in arrears and shutoffs. The National Regulatory Research Institute, for example, in a recent report found that past due gas utility accounts rose from 16.5% in 2001 to 21% in 2006. Last spring, in a survey we conducted, states reported that 1.2 million households were cut off from natural gas and electric service due to non-payment of electric bills. What I'd like to do briefly is just for you a couple of numbers that we've collected in the last two months, I think give a sense of just how serious this affordability problem is and how we think the 5.1 billion will really make a big difference in addressing the need. Um, for example, across the country, and again, we don't have national statistics on shutoffs or rearages, uh, how many people are behind on the heating oil bills, but the numbers we are getting are, are very, very scary. Arizona, in Arizona, the Public Service Commission reported that disconnections were up 40% over last year. Southern California Edison, for example, has shut off nearly 165,000 of its 4.8 million customers in the past six months. Excel Energy in Colorado expects to shut off 72,000 Colorado customers this year because of delinquent bills, a 33% increase from 2007. In Massachusetts, for example, at the end of May, Natural Grid reported that 115,000 out of 1.2 million electric customers were at least three months behind on their bills. And the numbers continue. What I'd like to do is just briefly review a survey that we conducted in June. We wanted to find out how families were coping across all income ranges, and we asked about how they were coping with high gasoline and home energy bills, because I believe that some of the reason for the increase in arrears and shutoffs, it's not just that home energy bills are going high, it's that families don't have enough money to pay for gasoline. The average family uses about 800 gallons of gasoline a year, so if gasoline is running about a dollar a gallon higher, that's about $70 a month more than they were paying last year at this time. Um, could we switch to the uh, survey? We surveyed 500 families across the country on all income groups. And what we found was we weren't surprised to see that poor families, those with incomes of under 150% of poverty, were responding that they were having trouble paying their energy bills. What we were worried about and surprised was that families between 151 and 250 percent of poverty, basically working families were finding that they were also reporting difficulties in paying these bills. We asked the question about whether energy costs had a large impact on their household. And again, families under 150 percent of poverty, those making about 35,000 a year, said yes. Um, about 38 percent reported difficulties paying it, but also about 19% of the next group up also said the same thing. Basically, families between about 35 and 50,000 a year were saying they were also struggling with these bills. But of course, the thing that was most worrisome was the um, two charts up. Next one. Okay. The next one where we said, well, okay, because of high energy and gas costs, did it change your purchasing plans? And we always knew that poor families had this problem. In all the previous surveys, very poor families always said they had to choose between heating and eating. But what we found this time, which is what really alarmed us, was that families between 150 and 250 percent of poverty, many of them were saying the same things. And these are families that normally we don't cover in energy assistance programs because we don't have enough money. And one of the advantages of going to 5.1 billion is the law, in the House bill at least, allows us to go to 75 percent of state median income. So for families in this next group, between 150 and 250, we're saying they're having trouble buying food, medicine, 
basic necessities, they can also be helped under this program this year. The next chart, of course, is, is a sign of poverty, but again, it's the next group up also that's reporting it. We ask them questions, did you close off parts of your home? Did you keep your home at an unsafe temperature? Did you leave the home part of the day because it was too cold or too hot? And again, we're seeing families that are in between 150 and 250 percent saying the same things as some of the very poorest families in the country are saying. Um, and of course, the next chart is the one that causes the most concern. We asked about skipping bill payments and also shutoffs. 29% um, of very poor families said they skipped paying their electric bill or utility bill, but 8% said they were shut off. But also families between 150 and 250% of poverty reported some of the same exact numbers. So what seems to be going on, I think, is a compression across incomes that it's no longer just the families earning less than 35,000 a year. I think it's becoming families earning less than 45 to 50,000 a year who are basically struggling to make ends meet. What I'd like to do is talk just briefly at this point. You asked me some questions about weatherization. And essentially, we don't think it's an either or. We don't think it's either weatherization or home energy assistance. Under the LAHI program, states are allowed to transfer up to 15% of their LAHI appropriation to weatherization. And on average, about 10% of that's transferred. So if the future is as in the past, and about 500 million is 5.1 billion will also transfer into weatherization programs. Um, these are extremely successful programs, but they're not well funded. Last year, only about 150,000 homes across the country received weatherization assistance. Weatherization returns about $2.72 about $2 in energy and non-energy benefits of the life of a weatherized home. It's a terrific investment. It also supports, um, um, it also supports about 20,000 jobs that come through the program. These are the green jobs that we're concerned about. And when thinking about green jobs, green collar jobs, the potential in the loan community is significant for weatherization. You know, about 25% of the, of the families in the United States are low income, and about 40% come under the 250% of poverty category. Many of these families can benefit from weatherization, and a lot of the jobs are not that highly skilled. So it's a great sort of entry point into, um, into a career for, for a lot of family, for a lot of um, uh, people right out of high school. Um, another point I'd like to mention um, to sort of wrap up my testimony, we've been looking a lot at other strategies to weatherize homes. Um, we've been working with the Ford Foundation to develop uh, an energy efficiency mortgage program that would help families integrate weatherization and energy efficiency as part of their mortgage. And this is a real opportunity as we look at all these subprime mortgages that are in trouble now that need to be refinanced to also make their homes more energy efficient at the same time. For families that make less than fifty to 60000 a year, Reducing their energy bill by 30% makes a very significant difference to their discretionary income. It not just reduces their energy bill, it strengthens their ability to maintain their home. And I think there's a great opportunity during this coming year as we look at how do we help low-income families move to a more stable mortgage, look at making a home energy efficient at the same time. It'll accomplish two very related goals. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Wolf, very much. Um, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Drew, can you move up to the table, please? Thank you. Um, our next witness is uh, Mr. John Drew, who is the Executive Vice President of, uh, of uh, Action for Boston Community Development, the largest nonprofit agency in New England. Uh, he's been a very prominent figure in this whole area of LIHEAP throughout his uh, uh, career. Um, a, a real national expert on the subject. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Drew, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Uh, thank you for letting me come before you today. First of all, I want to thank you because you are my congressman. And I want to thank you for everything you've done over the years. Action for Boston Community Development is a community action agency, one of 900 across the country. What we do is we are undergirded by a community service block grant, which we are so much grateful to this Congress for continuing that program. It, uh, it allows us to do a variety of programs, including Head Start, weatherization, a heat and assistance program. We also do programs for, for uh, we run a college, we run high schools. We'll do anything that we need to do to help people who are poor. 
Mr. Chairman, I just want to make a note that you are my congressman, and I very much appreciate the hard work you've done over many, many years. I thank you. I thank the. Uh, really. Thank you so much. You've been a true champion. Thank you. I also want to make note that I am so grateful for the governor of Massachusetts coming here today. Uh, I won't cast anything other than say this is the first governor in my time who's come before you on LIHEAP and done a heck of a job in Massachusetts. I have, uh, I mentioned the community service block grant, I mentioned uh, community action because I, I, they go together. I go back 36 years. I know I don't look it. But I go back 36 years, back to the OPEC time when we had that spike with that OPEC where the lines were log. And we have over 36 years trying to keep this program going through the ups and downs, through the period of time when we had enough money or we didn't have enough money. We put together weatherization programs. We put together programs that uh, provide for new burners and boilers. We've, we've matured to the point where we're actually doing windows and refrigerators and appliances working with utilities. But I must say from the bottom line, is that we're dealing with people who do not have enough income to live on. I left my office today to take an airplane, uh, lined up in the corridors in our building, and buildings was people who got there early this morning and have been getting there for quite a while, clutching in their hands, shut off notices, payment they can't make, looking very, very scared, bleak, and wondering how they're going to get through the winter. My experience over the years is then that if we do not intervene, we will see experiences of hypothermia. We have seen that. We have a woman, 94 years old, went to bed one night, decided that she couldn't afford the heat, couldn't pay the bills, and put as many blankets on as she could, and unfortunately in the morning she didn't get up. We have children who leave their house to go to school, and they're not able to think because they've been cold all night. We have a large Head Start program in the city of Boston, and thank you again, Congress, for keeping that and reauthorizing the Head Start program. But we have 2,600 children in Boston preschool. And for many, many of those children, the only heat, or the major part of the heat warmth they have that day is when they come to that center. The major caloric intake will be at that center. So I was with great fear and trepidation going into this summer with $5 a gallon. All I could think of was the Arctic air's coming. It's gonna be icy, it's gonna be cold, it's gonna be, ground freezing, we're gonna have snow. And what we, what's gonna to happen to all these folks? This is my Katrina, this is my Northeast. These people are gonna be standing out there with no ability to save themselves. They don't have incomes to be able to buy the product that's necessary. They're also trying to struggle to, to buy milk and increase, to buy products that have increased. Their incomes have not gone up at all. To the, they've really been compressed. So I just, I'm here basically to bear testimony on the part of so many people who need this program, whose families, and as Mark Wolf has said, more and more people are falling into the trap of being stagnated wages and not be able to be able to take care of their families. And it is an income issue. And I, over the years, I have struggled when people have come up with a debate which is we should do more weatherization and less of uh, the fuel assistance. And I say, fine, fine. Let's get the cost of energy down to the point where people can afford it. You cannot take out the payments before you can get the energy efficiency and we can bring down the oil price from overseas. I mean, it's just the gazenta. So I think that we need not only need both, we gotta keep up with the income. We, in fact, in our program, we pay the dealers directly. We work with the dealers, we work with the companies, we've got great relationships, and as a result of being able to run a LIHEAP program, every LIHEAP household who is eligible 
also is eligible for conservation, for boiler repair, boiler replacement. They get discounts from utilities up to 20% off their other bills. So we're leveraging an awful lot through this LIHEAP program. The downside is that we are getting more and more people in our homeless shelters. And in Massachusetts, in fact, there's five to 600 families in hotels as a result of not being able to maintain a household. My concern going into this winter is we're gonna see an epidemic of homelessness. So I was coming down here with bags of cement on my back saying, how are we gonna do this? We're gonna run out of assistance before Christmas. We're gonna be trying to figure out how we can keep these families and elders alive. And when I got the call that said $5.1 billion has been passed by this house, I just said, oh my God, this is great. And the Senate has to pass it, the President has to sign it. And with that, we'll be able, in Massachusetts, to be able to provide heating assistance right through the end of February. Think about that. We have so many people who are sitting there right now saying, how am I gonna make it? I, 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 everybody's got the following story, but it's true. And my building today was Mr. Mr. Warren. He comes in, he's 78, and uh, he's looking for assistance, and he's working in our elderly program, our foster grandparent program. I said, how are you doing today? He said, well, my wife and I were a little tough, but you know, we're getting by. It's gonna be a tough winter. I said, yeah. He said, where are you going? I said, I'm going down to uh, testify before Committee Washington about you know, heating assistance. He said, what's that all about? He said, well, you know, trying to get you some more money so you can get through the winter. Your wife's got these uh, huge bills for her disabilities and her medicines. He said, would you tell those folks something? I I'm really concerned. I, I don't understand how they can find trillions of dollars for, for bankers and stuff, and they can't help me get through the winter. And I said, well, I'll, I'll pass the story along. Uh, it was just true, and I appreciate that this committee understands that feeling, that feeling of helplessness, the help feeling that Nobody's really going to be there for you. Thank you, Mr. Um, and Thank so you, Mr. Drew. The, the $5.1 billion, let's hope that goes through. Let's hope we have it at the end. Let's hope we have it at the beginning of the season so we can assure people that they will have hope through the winter, that they will be able to buy their food, Thank they'll you. be able to buy their medicines, they'll be able to live a life normally, they'll get through the winter. Because right now, what we have, Mr. Chairman, in Massachusetts is 100,000 households way behind in the utility bills. We have 20,000 households already shut off. Mr. Uh, Drew, thank you. Thank you for your passionate presentation you. today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Now we'll move to our final witness, then we'll go to questions from our uh, uh, committee members. And our final witness is uh, Mr. Uh, Howard uh, Grunspecht, he is the Acting Administrator of the Energy Information Administration at the Department of Energy. Prior to joining uh, EIA, he was a resident scholar uh, at the Resources for the Future and served as its Director of Economics. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the short-term energy outlook for the United States, particularly for the upcoming winter. The Energy Information Administration is the independent statistical and analytical agency within the Department of Energy that produces objective, timely, and relevant uh, projections and analyses to assist policymakers, help markets function efficiently, and inform the public. And I noticed that uh, Mark Wolf mentioned many of our uh, products. We don't promote formulate or take positions on policy issues, and our views should not be construed as representing those of the department or the administration. Our most recent short-term energy outlook, released on September 9th, before Hurricane Ike hit the Gulf Coast, forecasts that residential heating oil prices during the upcoming heating season of October through March will average 413 per gallon, an increase of about 25 percent over the previous season. Residential natural gas prices over the same period are projected to average uh, nearly $15 per thousand cubic feet, an increase of about 17% over the previous heating season. Pr 
price increases for propane and electricity are projected to be about 11 percent and 8 percent, respectively. Uh, natural gas is used as the primary heating fuel by a majority of U.S. households, while oil is the primary heating fuel for about 7 percent of U.S. households. But as the other two witnesses have noted, heating oil use is heavily concentrated in the Northeast, where it is used by nearly one-third of households. Fuel expenditures for individual households are highly dependent on weather conditions, the size and efficiency of individual homes and their heating equipment, and thermostat settings. So while cross-fuel comparisons of average heating expenditures can be misleading because of differences in the extent to which each fuel is used in colder and milder areas of the country, the change in projected expenditures relative to the prior winter for each heating fuel provides a broad gauge as to expected movements in heating costs. Although all of the major heating fuels are expected to register sizable increases in total expenditures, heating oil customers are likely to be particularly hard hit with heating fuel expenditures for the average household using oil as the primary heating fuel expected to rise by $585 over last winter. The corresponding increases for households heated with natural gas and propane are $162 and $217 respectively while they are $86 for households using electricity. Uh, heating oil prices are expected to be significantly higher than last winter, primarily because crude oil prices are much higher. Higher crude oil prices account for about 68 cents per gallon of the projected increase of 85 cents per gallon uh, over the upcoming heating season relative to comparable year-ago period. Uh, increases in heating oil prices above those due to higher crude oil costs largely reflect tighter markets for diesel fuel worldwide. Diesel fuel and heating oil are connected as both products are very similar, except for the fact that diesel fuel contains less sulfur than heating oil. World diesel fuel demand growth is coming both from increasing transportation use and increasing use of distillate as a fuel for electricity generation, particularly in developing countries. And there are also a number of special circumstances uh, this year. Uh, turning to natural gas markets, the factors contributing to higher prices include uh, higher oil prices, low imports of liquefied natural gas, and some strength in the spot prices of natural gas in the first half of the year that will be reflected in the cost of gas that has been stored to be used this upcoming winter. Uh, colder than normal temperatures during the first four months of the year contributed to a substantial year-over-year -year decline in inventories of gas. Uh, the good news is that, taken together, robust domestic production of natural gas and limited consumption growth in electric power this summer, due to relatively mild summer temperatures, allowed for the rebuilding of natural gas storage uh, inventories. And at, by the end of August, uh, we actually were ahead of the five-year uh, average for the first time since February. We will be updating these uh, forecasts for the October edition of the Short-Term Energy Outlook, which will also include an expanded discussion of the upcoming uh, heating season. That concludes my statement, Mr. Chairman, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you or the other members may have. I, I thank you, you very much. And now we'll turn and we'll have uh, members of our committee ask questions and uh, recognize the gentlelady from California, uh, Ms. Solis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, all of you have give us, given us some interesting insight, include, including the governor. But I wanted to just ask our last witness who spoke if you could um, shed some light on uh, the recent effect that we saw in some Midwestern states with respect to uh, Ike, Hurricane Ike, where we saw some shortages in Tennessee and, you know, we saw a, a tremendous spike up in demand there. And, and obviously we're, we may see more of that happen as we see more... Uh, hurricanes hitting, um, hitting our areas where our major producers of, of crude and the refineries are found. Um, can you shed any light on that? I mean, what? I can shed a little bit of light on it. Uh, clearly, the, the two hurricanes uh, that, that hit the Gulf, one Louisiana, uh, the other Texas, which are both big areas for importing crude oil and big areas for refinery production, uh, had an impact. Uh, although uh, refinery capacity is really returning. Really, today, in today's report, for the first time, the amount of refinery capacity out is under a million barrels a day of capacity. It had been uh, up above 
well above 3 million barrels a day out at the peak. So there's been progress in bringing things back. But the areas that are served uh, either from crude oil or uh, that comes through the Gulf, because uh, some of the crude oil that's used in the Midwest comes through the Gulf and is shipped up to the Midwest by pipeline or by products that are produced in the Gulf. And that's affected mostly the South Atlantic states, would be Tennessee, uh, North Carolina, Georgia has had right. some issues. Uh, those are the areas that have seen the, uh, the most severe impacts. Uh, we have seen prices in those areas falling uh, in recent uh, days. Uh, just yesterday, we put out a report uh, on inventories that sort of looks at the last week. Uh, the last week was a tough week in that production was severely impacted by Hurricane Ike. We do see uh, the situation improving. There may be some spot uh, outages, mostly of gasoline. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, the uh, distillate market has done better. The diesel fuel and heating fuel market has not seen those outages. But gasoline is a little tight. I, I guess for me, I, I really have some concerns when we have discussions and debate about increasing more drilling along the southern part of our, of our country here and how rapid that infrastructure will go up and how many times in each season will we, will we find ourselves in a similar situation that natural resources like hurricanes and other are still going to dampen our ability to be able to get those products to market into that part of the country. And shouldn't we be thinking about other alternative uh, types of fuels? And some of you have mentioned that. Uh, I know the governor did in his presentation, but it just uh, it just hits home again that somehow we continue to be so reliant on the old way of doing things, and we're not really looking at projecting uh, what is currently happening, what the current state of of our uh, of our country is really in. And I and I want to thank Mr. Drew for coming all the way up from from uh, Massachusetts, Boston, because the program you talk about is very similar to one in my district um, that provides services actually through veterans. And they have veterans that are employed who come, come back that are either disabled, that get these jobs in the LIHEAP program, do weatherization in California. Our temperatures are a lot different, but we also have very needy families as well. We always find that there's a backlog of uh, families that need to have this assistance and not enough money. And the Community Redevelopment Block Grant Program has suffered tremendously under this administration. And we need to, to find other ways of infusing dollars. And I'm wondering if maybe programs like, for example, HUD, um, Department of Energy, um, and even EPA could somehow better collaborate with the community development block grant programs when we look at weatherization or trying to help uh, Re restructure our, our old buildings, even for landlords and some of our public housing, because I'm very concerned that when we talk about, for example, even removing lead paint in old buildings, at the same time, these same housing uh, structures are maybe built in the 1930s or 20s and could use some other forms of assistance, but we're not talking to each other. So it may not be another 10 years before the department of, of HUD or someone else goes out there and there, we're piecemealing, we're just putting a little Band-Aid on a much, a much far greater program, I mean, um, disease that we see uh, in housing and, and with our poor stock of housing in areas like Southern California. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I spent a lot of time over these years trying to take these silos and put them together as best we can. And we do a certain amount of work. We've done work with the Department of Energy, and we, the things we run into, for example, are asbestos removal, um, where lead, you get into lead. a pro and you get in, and all of a sudden you've got regulations and other things you have to deal with. So anytime we're dealing with trying to get something done in a household, we have to be well aware of all of the other rules and regulations. So we do, as best we can, try to pull together resources working with City Hall, CBG block grant. We try to put together something with a DOE. But I would not want to say to you that I feel comfortable that we are maximizing our resources and target them as directly as we can. Thank you. Thank you very much. The gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from South Dakota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I represent the state of South Dakota. I also have the honor of representing nine sovereign Sioux tribes. Uh, within their reservation boundaries, primarily within the state of South Dakota. And, you know, our temperatures, uh, we have got drastic ranges of temperatures. 
And even without a wind chill, we can be many degrees below zero. And then when you add the wind chill, we've had record temperatures anywhere from negative 40 to negative 70 below zero. So a couple of years ago, uh, and, and actually even I think last year, we had reports from one of the tribes uh, that I represent that people in very rural outlying areas were burning clothing in order to stay alive and warm uh, because we're dealing with severe poverty in many of these areas as well. And I guess my first question would go to you, Mr. Wolf. I've had some discussions with the Rosebud Sioux Tribe about how um, they didn't get leveraging incentives uh, last year because there was language omitted in the FY08 um, budget. And so if you could talk a little bit more about the LIHEAP leveraging incentives and as well the Residential Energy Assistance Challenge option, uh, because again, I'm wondering if other states or communities are experiencing the same problem because of that omitted language. And then in general, could you just discuss whether or not you think tribes face particular challenges with regard to energy assistance uh, for their members, especially in more rural areas? Yes, um, I'd be glad to. There was an omission in the FY08 appropriation uh, for LAHEAP, so leveraging wasn't funded, nor were REACH grants. Um, for some states, this created a problem because leveraging really is the funds, the leveraging funds are the funds they use often to fund their discretionary activities, provide supplemental energy assistance. Um, leveraging is also targeted, weighted towards small states or small population states. So where large states receive about 1%, I mean, it doesn't pay a lot. Leveraging on averages pays only about 1 or 2% of the total amount of money that's raised outside of LAHEAP. But for small population states, it can go to 3%, which can be quite significant. It can be $100,000, $200,000. So we heard from a number of states that, that really was a problem. They had to cut back services. REACH is um, really the demonstration grant part of LAHEAP. Um, we don't really have a dedicated research budget in LAHEAP other than the REACH grants. And this was the first year since it was started that we didn't have funding. Again, it seemed to be an omission in the law. And, uh, HHS uh, decided they had to go ahead and reallocate those funds, I think it was in June, because um, we thought maybe they could wait longer, they said they couldn't wait for a fix in the law. So the seven or eight uh, demonstration grants that would have been given out weren't given out. And they're multi-year, and they do make a difference to um, the local agencies that use them, because they're really designed to create new approaches to funding energy assistance. Um, and then lastly, your question on um, tribes. It's different in each state. Some states, uh, the tribes act as basically sovereign nations. They, they receive funds directly from HHS. Other states, um, they receive funds through the state. So the state acts as the, the grantee. Um, I've looked at the numbers, and, and frankly, the, the allocations to tribes in many cases are just very, very small, and especially in light of the poverty on some of the reservations. Does it differ in, when you describe? What have you seen in the disparities of what tribes get if they're getting the direct allocation versus what they end up getting if they have to go in terms of the block grant through the states? Is there a discrepancy that um, you've seen in that analysis? Some states have told me that if they go under the block grant, the tribe will receive more money. Uh, some states have told you that. Has that yeah. Have you verified that? Uh, we, I haven't done any research on it, but they've said they've offered, they've talked to the tribes about going as part of the block grant and then give them a higher allocation. Um, but they said that many tribes would prefer to stay as sovereign nations for the purposes of dealing with HHS. I think that because tribes overall don't receive that much money from the program, this is something worth looking at. Thank you. Um, um, before my to look at it. For you. Thank you. Before my time expires, just one other quick question for Mr. Grunspecht. Our problem is this: that there's 12 minutes left to go on the House floor, and the general lady only has 30 seconds left. Yes. So I would like to be able to recognize. Okay, the other two. Members. Just a question on propane. Okay because many people I represent rely on propane, the recipients of propane for heating fuel. Mr. Grunspeck, could you just discuss the price trends for propane in recent months and years and what families who rely on propane can expect this winter? Yeah, uh, let me quickly try to flip to that. Uh, I think propane is uh, not as tough a situation as heating oil. It probably is the second toughest uh, situation. So for propane, uh, nationally, uh, we would expect a 13 percent increase in expenditures, and in the mid 
I'm trying to think whether you're in the West or in the Midwest. Uh, probably both, huh? You're, you're a big state. Uh, in the Midwest, 11.4% uh, increase in expenditures for propane. Great. So. Gentlelady's time has expired. The Chair recognizes. Uh, we will we'll divide it to three minutes apiece. I will make it and, short. And then you could each uh, Thank you, ask us. Gentlemen from New York, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will submit my statement for the record and just ask two questions. Uh, and if you could answer me, uh, starting with Mr. Drew, uh, even with the $5.1 billion appropriation, is it possible or even likely that more contingency, contingency funds will be needed this year? I hope not. I hope not. Oh, that's I, uh, just quickly, we, we could use. That's fine. That's quick enough. Thank okay. you. Uh, Mr. Grunspeck? Uh, that would be a policy question, so I would pass that to Mr. Wolf. Okay, Mr. Wolf, please. Well, um, no, 5.1 billion won't be enough. Um, if you look at the Northeast, low-income families paid 14 billion dollars for heating oil last year. This year, it's going to be in the range of 17 billion. If uh, the additional money was just prior to heating oil, it would use it all up. So it's quite likely that we'll need more money. But again, you know, in a practical sense, 5.1 billion, you know, is okay. an enormous increase. So it's uh, sort of thank six you. of one, six of another. Okay, got it. Uh, second thing is. Uh, the administration tried to kill in their budget to kill the weatherization uh, assistance program, and we restore that uh, today uh, in the House bill. Do you have a suggestion as to how we can better coordinate LIHEAP, uh, low income heating assistance, with weatherization expenditures in order to maximize their effectiveness? I um, think we have a terrific partnership now in most states. Um, State agencies work close, very closely together, and many states are in the same office. The problem is there's just not enough money in weatherization. That's the real, real bottom line problem. Uh, gentlemen, concur? I guess you concur. But in Massachusetts, we have uh, deregulation, so we're doing more weatherization through utility companies to double our weatherization. That's good. Thank you. I yield back. Great. The gentleman from um, uh, Missouri, Mr. Kleber, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me apologize, first of all, uh, for not being here. Uh, I'm, I'm on the what is essentially the banking committee, and we've been all day yesterday and today. I apologize, uh, but I came over even though that committee is still going because I. I but I think uh, uh, Mr. Hall asked one of the, the primary questions that I was going to ask. I, I'll throw a softball, <clears throat> uh, and I, it, anybody can hit it. I would imagine Mr. Drew might has already uh, swung at it before. But uh, the. the uh, 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 we're going to have to do a rescue program. Uh, we're going to have to do it, have to. Uh, do you think that the current level of funding for LIHEAP will allow those who are uh, struggling uh, to have any level of appreciation for a rescue program of Wall Street? I don't know if they'll have an appreciation. Uh, they'll, they're trying to live in by themselves. and. Uh, I did mention that there was a person who said, I don't understand how they can spend trillions of dollars and not help me get through the winter. They're making a direct connection between the two. No, I don't think so. I, when you look at incomes for families making less than 50000 a year, they're living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, across the board the last five years, between higher health care costs and now higher energy costs, higher rental costs, um, they just don't have any resources. So when you talk about $700 billion bailout, the number is so enormous. Uh, the average family only saves $300 a year now. So I think that LAHIP helps, and it only helps take some of the edge off of this, but the magnitude of the bailout versus, you know, LAHIP is, is what? Um, less than 1% of the total bailout amount. I think it's, it's, it's hard to get your hands around the bailout numbers, I think. Yeah, it's less than 1%, yeah. Gentlemen's time uh, has expired. We're going to give each one of you 30 seconds to tell us, in summary, what you want us to remember. There's, there's four roll calls on the House floor. You have 30 seconds to have something ring through our brains in the rest of this session in winter in terms of this program. We'll start with you, Mr. Wolf. Yeah, I, I would say a fully funded law heap and weatherization program working together will make the difference between families not being able to afford access to electricity, natural gas, and heating oil, and being able to afford it. Mr. Greenspeck. 
uh, we need to work with the states throughout the winter. And we have a state heating oil and propane program. We'll be tracking the prices on a weekly basis. I think there are other improvements we need to make, uh, particularly this year. We've had a lot of exports of distillate fuel. It took us a while to catch up with that. Uh, that's something that I think uh, a better data program would be helpful in tracking movements of products. Okay. And you have the final word, Mr. Drew. Well, to, uh, I first of all, thank you. <clears throat> and this, what we're talking about is money that's filling a hole in the face of poverty. I am glad that it's happening, but I think I want to think about an overall anti-poverty effort by, the, I hope, the new administration. I would like to just end today because I know you're busy, but we know that to put the end of the cycle of crisis that drags the hardworking families and retirees to the path of economic security, your Climate and Protection Act, H.R. 6186, is the best proposal we have, have considered to vote significant investments to making low-income communities and housing sustainability and affordable. It is fair, does not waste precious resources or give away to polluters or energy Vendors is consistent with the fair climate changes principles. The community action has developed with the National Community Action Foundation, Friends of the Earth, Public Citizens, the National Consumer Law Center. And with your permission, I would like to submit these as part of my testimony. And I wish very much to thank you very much. I thank you, Mr. Drew. And I, I gave you an extra 30 seconds because of the obvious wisdom that you were um, <laughs> bringing to the committee. Um, I have a group of questions which I did not get a chance to ask on this round, and I'm going to, we're going to submit it to you in writing, and we would appreciate uh, the answers in writing uh, from you in a timely uh, fashion. We thank uh, you each for coming here today. Uh, with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.